Hello and welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Clara Vello. And today in the studio with me is Mr. John Lawson, who is the director of Escape Ministries. Now, in 2007, after being released from prison, John had a burning passion and desire to share his newfound faith with those around him. And as from 2008, John began his ministry, a voluntary ministry, as the director of Escape Ministries and has ministered in over 22 countries around the world. John, thank you so much for joining us here on Revelation TV. It's such a pleasure, Clara. Thank you so much for having me. And you're welcome. It's wonderful. You're certainly not, a get, not, uh, not the first time that you've been here with us, uh, joining us on Revelation TV. And it's always so wonderful to, to see you. And I'm so looking forward to sh you sharing your testimony sure. with those. I know the last time you were here, you shared your uh, testimony of your upbringing. Mm -hmm. and what the Lord has done in your life mm -hmm. as a child up until now. Yes. So for those that don't know you and uh, those that may know you but don't necessarily know where the Lord has brought you from, yes. could you share with us your testimony? Yeah, sure. I'd be delighted to. Um, please remember when, I, when I'm sharing that I'm, I'm very ashamed of a lot of my story. It's not normal to stand before people or, or, or come on television and and, and look at people through a lens and, and expose your, your life, um, particularly when there's so many um, bad memories I have. I feel like I, I've got so much blood on my hands, Clara, you know. I, I led a very violent life. Um, there was some childhood trauma. My father locked me in a flat and, and basically left me to die. He left me there for four days without food and ran off with another woman while my mum was in the UK to see her sick father. And Fortunately, some friends, they helped me to get back to the UK and I was brought up in a housing estate called Drumchapel, which was the, the most violent place to live in the whole of Europe in 1977. That was a bit of a culture shock to me because I was raised in South Africa from the age of three till ten, a uh, different lifestyle. And I grew up with a lot of violence in my life and never did well at school. We later, we moved to Merseyside and the whole cycle started again. I'm, I'm sorry that... I broke into factories and stole things, and by the time I left school, I was just good at one thing. I was good at fighting, I was good with my fists, and I went straight into the nightclub industry. I became a bouncer all over the northwest of England, in places like Blackburn and Burnley and Manchester and Liverpool, and, you know, I thought I was a real tough guy, and I worked with a team of men who were all ex-special forces, and my brother am amongst them, and um, it was a crazy lifestyle, very violent, and... Well, me, because I was a real idiot, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the fact now they paid me to be involved in fighting. Um, my uncles, they were running most of Soho in London. This is something I never touched on last time, but um, I think we should touch on it today. My, my uncles, they pretty much run the sex industry in Soho. They ran all the peep shows and, and brothels and all that kind of stuff, and I got attracted to that life because I just wanted money. I didn't believe in God, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, money was my God, really. It was the God that I worshipped, and I would do anything for money. Eventually, I trained to become a bodyguard, and I worked with people like the Rolling Stones for a short time and other famous people, and again, thought I was a, a big, important man. I was married with children at that time, and I always justified m my actions by saying, well, I'm a good man, uh, you know, I have a wife, I don't beat her, I don't do drugs or drink. And um, these people I'm working with, well, that's just how it is. Um, in those circles where there's a lot of money and rock and roll, you'll often find somebody has a problem with money. And when those people at the top have a problem, well, they, they don't want to get their hands dirty. So they'll come to thugs, idiots like me and my men, and we would be the ones that would come and find you if you were stupid enough to steal money from these kind of people. And um, I'm afraid to say um, I've got lots of bad memories in my head. I held men hostage. I, I tied men up. I beat men um, in horrible ways. And um, I was just an animal. Uh, to cut a long story short, the police, they finally caught up with me. I was put into prison, a high security jail outside Stirling in Scotland. And there was an African man, a Nigerian there, who I became friends with. He was a lovely guy called Tony, with a big smile on his face. But one thing I didn't like, he was a Christian. 
And he was always going on about Jesus and God, a little bit too much for my liking. And for four months, he invited me to the Bible study, and I refused. But one day, I changed my mind, because he told me something very important as a prisoner. He said to me, that pastor who comes in to do the Bible study, you know, he brings with him nice cake and coffee and biscuits. <laughs> well, I said, you didn't tell me that before. And so I changed my mind, and I went to the Bible study to steal the coffee and cake and biscuits. I was impacted, however, that evening by 12 prisoners who were murderers and drug dealers and, mm. and lifers, and how they were so happy to be there in this environment. That struck me. Then the pastor got out a guitar, and I thought, oh, no. They've got to start with all these religious hallelujahs now. It's the last thing I need. But I was, I was looking at the words of the song sheet. I had this, this piece of paper, and um, I was looking at the words. It was a song called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. And these men began to sing. And as they were singing and as I was reading, I just knew I was going to cry. I tried to hide it because it started here. It began to rise, and I, I, I hid my face behind the paper like this. And, and um, I just cried like a baby. And the next morning, I was very confused. I was challenged. And there was this African man standing outside my cell when they opened the door. He had a Bible in his hands, which he gave to me. He had it behind his back, and he said, I've got this for you. I said, well, I don't want a Bible. Why do I want that? Uh, you know, it's, what does God want with me? I'm just a violent animal, you know? It's, what would God want with such an idiot like me? And um, I took the Bible and I threw it onto my bed in a huff. But that evening, I opened the Bible, and I didn't know where to begin. I had it upside down and back to front, and I just kind of opened it up, and it opened up in the book of Ezekiel. And the very first thing I read challenged me, because I knew it was speaking about me. It was from Ezekiel 18, verse 27 to 32. And I read, But if a wicked man turns away from the wickedness that he has committed, and if he does what is just and right, then he can save his life. He won't have to die, because he considers all of the offenses that he has committed. He turns away from them, he will surely live. And then God's children, they complain, the house of Israel. They say, Oh, the ways of the Lord are not just. And God says, no, <laughs> is it not your ways that are unjust? Therefore, I will judge each one of you according to your ways, declares the sovereign Lord. So repent, rid yourself of all the offenses you've committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Well, in that prison cell, I just knew I wanted a new heart and a new spirit, but I didn't know how to get it. And so the following week, I went back to that Bible study, and I asked that pastor, Pastor, how, how is it I can have this new heart, new spirit? Is this real? And uh, he very gently shared the gospel message with me that Christ came into the world to save sinners. It tells us in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. Jesus said in Luke 19.10, I came to seek and save the lost. And I was lost, believe me. Uh, he told me that Christ died on that cross for me, and that he paid the price for my life with his blood, and that God can legally dismiss the case against me when I stand before him on Judgment Day, if I'm willing just to repent and put my faith and trust in Christ. Well, that was it. I did those things in that prison, and he gave me a new heart and a new spirit. He changed me from the inside out. He's still changing me today, and uh, he has rebuilt my life ever since. And really, that's my story. Wow, a portion of it. Yes. And uh, it's, it's, it's so powerful, John. And thank you so much for um, opening up your life and opening up your heart to testify of all the things that you've done and, and what you've been through. It's so impacting. Now, the last time you were here, you shared your testimony. And what has the Lord done in your life since then? Well, it's amazing, Clara. You know, I was struck by Isaiah 6, you know, when... Um, as I said, and I heard the Lord of the voice say, Whom shall I send? And I said, Here I am, send me. Well, that was where I was at. I, I didn't know any, anything else in life. I just knew I had received this amazing grace, a gift of eternal life, and, and I had a desire to share my faith with others. And I just, on my knees, just said, Here I am, Lord, send me. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And, and no money, and I just got involved in ministry. And uh, I remember my first mission. I, I went off to Moldova and Ukraine for a six-week mission, and that was in 2008. 
And since then, uh, the Lord has taken me to over 22 countries, uh, as far afield as New Zealand, where I have gone into some of the toughest prisons on the planet to speak to some of the massive big Maori guys with tattoos all over their faces, to prisons on the other side of the world, way up in Guatemala or French Guyana, and everywhere in between. Um, I'm frequently in South Africa and other African countries, uh, like uh, Zambia, where I've visited a lot of prisons in Zambia, and the conditions there are just awful. And we write to prisoners, and it's quite amazing the Lord has taken me to prisons where people have come up to me and said, John, it's me, you know, it's me, you write to me. It's, it's, it's quite amazing to, uh, to meet people you actually write to. So yeah, I, I visit today some of the toughest prisons on the planet to share the gospel. And what's the kind of reception that you get from the prisoners? Because I can only imagine that they are hardened and that they're probably in a situation in their mind and in their hearts just thinking that there is nothing and no one that can save them from mm. that situation. How do they treat you when you take this gospel to them? Well, I'm not sure what they expect or what they've been told. They probably think, here comes another do-gooder, some foreigner come to preach to us. Perhaps they think I'm a pastor or uh, I'm very educated in theology. Um, and it soon becomes apparent that I'm just a simple man that came to faith in prison and I've walked in their shoes. And I think immediately the ice is broken because I've walked in their shoes and I had no hope and no future. And they're sitting there thinking they have no hope and no future. And when I can talk to them about what Christ has done in my life, how he's taken an animal, a violent animal, how he has offered that animal a home and hope and tamed me and loved me and cared for me and given me a future, um, that offers them hope. And it's amazing to see a hardened attitude when they first walk in a room and sit down with their arms folded, a little skeptical sometimes. Um, it's quite amazing to, to see the arms unfold, the posture change, and then when the gospel is proclaimed, and then to pray for them afterwards, to hear these grown men, hardened criminals, crying and weeping, not because of anything I've done, because the Holy Spirit has just brought in a conviction to their hearts, and it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. Wow. And uh, you've been in full-time voluntary ministry since 2008. Yes. And you have such a passion uh, to save the lost, and especially going into some of the most toughest prisons on the planet. What motivates you? What keeps you going? Well, the Holy Spirit keeps me going. He's my motivation. But um, when I got released from prison, I, I was so disappointed um, that lots of Christians weren't out sharing their faith because, well, I, I, I read the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I, I read Mark 16, 15, where Christ says, go into the world and, and proclaim the gospel. And then I, I was so confused that most people didn't want to do that, most Christians. And then I read statistics from uh, Tear Fund and other Christian organizations that said 98% of Christians in the West don't share their faith, uh, which is the complete opposite to all of the stories of the early apostles and disciples where 100% of them went to share their faith because they found something amazing. And I was so disturbed. I didn't understand what, what's, what's wrong with you. Are you not saved by the same thing that I'm saved from? You know, were you not heading to hell, but Christ reached in and pulled you from that pit and, and loved you? Yes, we've got different stories, but we've all been saved from the same thing. Um, why aren't you sharing your faith? And it really disturbed me. Um, and so I just said to the Lord, please help me. I guess in Escape Ministries, we focus on two areas. Reaching the lost with the gospel and teaching the found how to share their faith. And so um, I'm often in various countries, teaching in Bible colleges or churches as well, or community groups, to encourage and equip Christians to go out and share their faith. And it's, it's coming to an understanding that we're in a war. It's a spiritual war. And, and so I'm coming at it from that angle to try and encourage and equip them. And to what share would you faith. say to that person who's watching right now who would love to share their faith with their colleagues, with their family members, but they are intimidated and they are full of fear. Well, Where do they begin, John? It's very important to, to look at this question. Um, I mentioned a spiritual war. And, um, well, let me, let me take you through the Bible, Clara, very quickly here, on why we're in the spiritual war. Because when we understand this, it will give us maybe 
um, a little bit of conviction. Um, and conviction is different from condemnation. Conviction will spur you and motivate you to do something about it. Condemnation is of the devil and he'll put you down and shut your mouth. But, you know, if we recognize we're in a spiritual war, the Bible tells us in Exodus 15.3 that the, the Lord is a man of war. It says the Lord is his name. In Colossians, we have Calvary depicted like a battle scene. It says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, you know, he made a, spe a, a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We have there in, in um, 2 Timothy 2.3 that Christians are described as soldiers. Um, endure hardship with us like good soldiers of Christ Jesus. We're told in the Bible we have an enemy. It tells us in Ephesians 6, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Um, we're also given strategies, many strategies in the Bible, but one I could pick out would be James 4, verse 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee. And, um, of course, we're given armor. In uh, Ephesians 6, we've got the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, the footwear of readiness, which is the gospel, and prayer, which is often missed from that one. So, you see, we've got a man of war, we've got a battle scene, we've got an enemy, we've got a strategy, we've got armor, um, and we've got weapons as well, which is the gospel. But as Christians, well, what is it we're warring over? As Christians, the church is warring over so many things, which is fantastic. We're warring over things like poverty, injustice, uh, starvation and hunger, um, trafficking. I mean, the church is engaged in so many powerful wars, but... Ultimately, what is our war? What are we here for? Well, if we were to take from the Bible the mission statements of Christ, I referred to them earlier, Luke 19.10, where Jesus said from his own lips, I came to seek and save the lost. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. Well, if we were going to take a, a mission statement from Christ, we could look no, no further than there. And what is the greatest battle? Well, it's for souls. It's for the souls of men and women to the glory of Jesus Christ. And how we can participate in that? Well, we can just share the gospel. And we, there's only one savior. We, we can't save anybody, but we can share the gospel. And then it's really important to remember the question you asked, what about those people who are fearful? Well, the Bible tells us we've got an enemy. He's trying to shut the mouths of Christians. He's working hard. And unfortunately, he's been successful if 98% of Christians aren't doing it. And again, why is the devil uh, motivated to shut your mouth? Well, he knows what's going to happen to him at the end, right? In Revelation 20.10, well, he's going to be bathing in a, in a lake of burning sulfur. And also, the devil knows scripture. And he re remembers there in, in Matthew um, 24.14, when the disciples were asking Jesus, well, when will these end times be? And of course, he gave a lot of indications, which I, I think we can see in, in the world today. But he also said, and this gospel must be preached, and then the end will come. The end will come. And so this okay. gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations as a testimony. Yes. And then the end will come. So the enemy, well, he knows that there will be what we could call global evangelism. In other words, everybody will get to hear the gospel. And after this, we don't know when, but it will be occur sometime after this that Christ will come back. And the enemy is going to be thrown into that prison. He doesn't like that. So he's working hard to shut the mouths of Christians um, so we don't bring his end quicker. Yeah. Um, and so the Bible tells us, and Christians know, that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And your motivation or, or your desire to share your faith should simply be Christ loves you. Yes. He's, offered you um, he's offered you life and life eternal. Share that with others and don't be afraid. Yes. The Holy Spirit will be with you. John, your testimony is so powerful and looking at you now, you have overcome so much and you are walking in God's confidence and you're preaching the gospel by faith. Now, there are people who may be watching the show and thinking, well, that's what he did. He's, he looks confident mm -hmm. and he's doing everything that God has called him to do. But I have sinned so much. Mm. Um, I don't think God could ever forgive me. Yeah. I don't think I could be right with man and are walking in condemnation. Sure. What would you say to that person right now who is living in that state of mind where they feel that they have done all that they could do mm -hmm. and they're sitting in a pit somewhere and, and just don't know if God could ever receive them sure. the way that he has received you? Yes, well, you know, um, that was me. 
I was there, I was violent, I was in prison, I was thinking about more crime. And Christ rescued me. If he, if he can rescue me, then he can do it for you. But maybe I can share the example of a mission in Romania where one of the ladies was, that we were speaking to in a women's prison, she was, um, she was hanging at the back. She was reluctant to come forward. And um, when I did speak to her, she said, well, I didn't come forward or sit down the front because I don't feel worthy. Um, I'm a prostitute. I'm so dirty. I'm so dirty. Excuse me. What would Christ ever want with me? And um, I could only look her in the eye and say, Well, I was dirtier. I was dirtier. And he offered me a way out. And um, we shared the gospel with that lady. Uh, she was in tears at the end. I don't know if she gave her life to Christ or not. But you might be sitting there thinking that you're unworthy. Well, we're all unworthy. The Bible tells us we are. There's nothing we can do to earn it. No amount of good works, no amount of going out and sharing the gospel or running around the world like I'm doing is ever going to save you. No, what saves you is you putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ because he willingly went to that cross for you and for me and he welcomes all regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you're at right now. Christ is waiting for you. He offers you eternal life. If you're just willing to just say sorry to him, Receive his forgiveness and put your faith and trust in him. Believe me, I promise you, not because John Lawson's promising you, but because God's word says he's waiting for you. He loves you. Put your faith and trust in him. Okay. Now, we don't have long to go, and that was just so powerful. I really believe that the Spirit of God is moved and has moved into those who are listening. Now, you have a, a new book that, um, uh, that you have on your website called If a Wicked Man. Tell us about that book. Well, um, If a Wicked Man is the full behind-the-scenes uh, story of my life. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of horrible, rotten stuff in there. It goes into great detail. Um, it's a book that was spurred on by a short version called Take Him Down, which is a Kindle book. Um, that was really designed for Christians as an encouragement. Um, but I wanted to, to do more than that. I wanted to reach the hard-to-reach people. I wanted to reach the kind of people that will never pick up a Christian book, if it smells of Christianity, they will never pick it up. And so this book has been designed to go undercover. It's going to go into the true crime biography section, not the Christian section. Um, it goes into a lot of detail about my life. Um, but the integrity of the gospel is, is kept intact within the book. So it will draw the reader in to all that horrible fluff and rubbish. And it will lead them to that point in prison where I give my life to Christ. There we give them the gospel. Um, so it's designed as a tool to reach the lost. Amen. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. And if you would like to know more information about John Lawson's ministry, please visit his website, which is being shown on the screen right now. Now, John, just a couple of seconds, actually, to speak to the people, to encourage them to step out there, just to cover everything that you've said in a nutshell within uh, for about 30 seconds, to step out and to really minister the gospel to people and to not be ashamed of their past, which is really something that holds a lot of Christians back, yeah. is that they're ashamed of their past. Yeah. Um, speak to those people who shouldn't be ashamed of their yeah. past and to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony that it is what they have been through that will set other people free and that will draw people more to Christ. Yes. Well, I heard a great quote recently that said that the, the church has moved away from being fishers of men and has now become keepers of the aquarium. And that's not how it's supposed to be. But I guess if I could just leave you from a great, a, a great quote from Hudson Taylor that said, the Great Commission is a command to be obeyed, not an option to be considered. I promise you, if you step out and share your faith, regardless of your past, think about your future, your future with Christ, and think about those people that have no hope and no future, and how you can offer that to them. Okay, share your faith with others. I promise you it will revolutionize your walk with God. You know, I want to leave you with Philemon 6, where Paul in the NIV version says, I pray you will be active in sharing your faith so that you will come to a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. So if you want to find every good thing, share your faith. God bless you. And what's next for John Lawson Ministries, for Escape Ministries? Well, I'm heading back off to South Africa for a month 
We, we've got a five-year plan there to open schools of evangelism and uh, with other countries. I just want to keep going. I just want to share my faith. I need to be sent. Um, can you help me? Can you send me? Well, I'm willing. Um, get in touch. <laughs> okay. John, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on the show today. And uh, we pray all the best for your ministry. And we know that only God will take you to where you need to get to. Viewers, thank you so much for joining me. I'm your host, Clara Vello.